We live in a world with incomplete, imperfect, and sometimes misleading information. This problem of not knowing how everything is going to work out puts us in a state of uncertainty. But despite that, we still have to make enough sense of the world around us to make decisions every day. Though there is so much uncertainty to navigate in our lives and in our decisions, the good news is that thinking probabilistically can help. Thinking probabilistically involves using tools of probability to help us pursue a more accurate view of the current and possible future state of the world. When we utilize and practice probabilistic thinking skills, we engage our slower, more deliberate system two thinking to help us estimate, predict, and update our beliefs to the best of our ability, given the information and resources available. And in so doing, we can address uncertainty intentionally and rationally. In this module, we will explore probabilistic thinking concepts that when practiced and honed can lead to more rational decision making. Now, we want to quickly highlight an important distinction between things in the world that are uncertain, but for which we can do things to mitigate that uncertainty, versus the rare events that are truly random, meaning every time they happen, they're truly unpredictable. So for example, things like fair dice tosses or coin flips are examples of randomness. Each time you flip that coin or toss those dice, there is no way to predict the outcome. No one will be better at predicting the outcome than anyone else, regardless of how much skill or content knowledge they have. This differs from situations in which you simply have uncertainty surrounding an outcome. There are a number of reasons you could have uncertainty. One reason might be that you are missing information. For example, when playing Jenga, you may not be fully versed on all the laws of physics. We might not know exactly how each piece is being pressed together. If we had that information, it would be useful in helping us to predict the outcome of removing certain pieces. But the challenge is that for most of us, we just don't have it. You could also have uncertainty because of things you can't ever possibly know in a situation. For example, what someone else will do in a moment or what decisions someone else will make. Other times there may be deliberately misleading information, which can create a situation of uncertainty. So we want to really briefly just distinguish between events that are truly random and no amount of information will help you predict more precisely and events where you just simply don't have all the information, skills, or abilities to make predictions, thus leading to a more heightened state of uncertainty. Thinking probabilistically can help us navigate those uncertain events with more precision and confidence. If you previously took the module on recognizing and resisting cognitive biases, you are familiar with the many ways that heuristics and cognitive biases impact our decision making. There is some empirical evidence from research studies that shows that being numerate, including having a positive disposition toward using basic math to think more carefully about situations, and being well-versed in some of these probabilistic thinking concepts, actually reduces our susceptibility to some of the biases we learned about in that module. So let's take a look at one of these studies. Researchers asked participants questions like the ones you saw in the knowledge check just before this video. And here we see the percentage of participants who answered correctly. We're not going to discuss the answers specifically, but we will show you the correct answers just in case you're curious. And based on participants' responses to these questions and other similar questions, researchers classified the participants as either low numerate or high numerate. Participants were also given some other questions, like the ones you answered, where they were asked to rate the quality of students' work based on some information they were given. One participant might have seen something like, Emily got 74% correct on her exam. And then another particip participant might see something that says, Emily got 26% incorrect on her exam. Now we can see here, if we do the math, that the scenarios are the same. In both scenarios, Emily got 74% correct and 26% uh, incorrect. They're just framed differently. So this is an example of the framing effect in which the way that information is presented can influence our judgments and decisions. And the question researchers had was, how would the negative or positive framing affect how participants rated the students and how might numeracy interact with that?
So let's go ahead and look at the overall pattern first. What we're showing on the y-axis here is the mean of the ratings participants gave the quality of the work. And we can see here the ratings of the participants who were shown the negative framing on the black bars. And then we can see the ratings of the participants who were given the positive framing on the gray bar. So just a reminder that in both framings, the student's performance was the same. What differed was whether participants saw it framed as the percent incorrect or the percent correct. We'll talk about the difference between these two sets of bars in a moment, but to begin, let's just look at the overall pattern. So the people who saw the students' scores in terms of what they answered correctly rated their performance much higher than those who saw the students' scores in terms of what they answered incorrectly. And overall, this shows us how the framing effect impacts how we interpret the same information differently. What's new here is that these two sets of bars represent the different groups based on their numeracy or fluency with probabilistic thinking. And we can see a much bigger framing effect on those participants who were classified as having low numeracy. So the takeaway here is that if we can train ourselves to be more numerate, we can also impact our susceptibility to and potentially reduce certain cognitive biases such as the framing effect. When it comes to decision making, probabilistic thinking can help us approach uncertainty caused by incomplete, imperfect, or misleading information with more intention, open-mindedness, and a willingness to constantly calibrate and update our beliefs. In the real world, it is very rare that we can say, yes, this absolutely will happen, or no, this will never happen. Most of what happens in the real world is somewhere in between. And we think probabilistically all the time when we make a choice or judgment between two or more options. So for example, when we ponder whether it will be quicker to take this route or that route to work, or when as a teacher, I consider if I start my students on this assignment 10 minutes before the end of class, will they actually be able to dismiss on time for the bell or should I wait until tomorrow? The way that most people make forecasts every day is through words most often. So we say things like maybe or likely or probably or probably not. And the challenge with using words to convey probability is that words are not precise. They're not always interpreted in the same way by different people. In order to be precise, we want to use a shared language of numbers to convey probability estimates so that everyone is on the same page and so that we ourselves have a better sense of what different probabilities feel like. To dig a little deeper now into the why the precision of thinking probabilistically with numbers rather than words is so important, we'll look at some materials and research developed by our colleagues at Good Judgment, which is an organization founded by psychology professors Phil Tetlock and Barbara Mellers, and which is dedicated to providing forecasting services to nonprofits, governments, and the private sector. So the following slides, you'll see some of their materials, which we will learn from here. So to begin, this beautiful location here is a photo of the Bay of Pigs on the southern coast of Cuba. And for those of you familiar with U.S. history from the 20th century, you may know that something famous happened here. In 1961, John F. Kennedy wanted to know if he could invade Cuba and succeed in deposing Fidel Castro at the time. So he asked the CIA, what is the likelihood of success by invading Cuba? And the CIA responded that timely execution of this plan has a fair chance of success. So hearing this, JFK decided to go ahead with the, with the mission, which, as many of you may know, was a failed mission that resulted in many casualties and captured soldiers. So the question is, what do you think fair chance means? What does this phrase mean to you? Well, by reading memoirs and records from that time, we know that when Kennedy heard fair chance, this equated in his mind to somewhere north of a 50% chance of success. But when the people who wrote the analysis were asked, it became clear that the CIA interpreted fair chance to be closer to around 25%. Kennedy and his counterparts in the CIA had completely different ideas of what the words fair chance of success meant. And because of that, decisions were made based on imprecise interpretations, and unfortunately, people were harmed. Our colleagues over at Good Judgment studied how different words that are related to judgments of probability are interpreted by different people. 
they asked people to share their interpretations of words like maybe, maybe not, risky, distinct possibility, and others by attaching numerical probabilities to them. Now let's take a look at their ranges. They are huge. Some people interpreted the word maybe to mean as low as a 22% or as high as an 89% probability. And they interpreted maybe not to mean as low as a 9% probability of happening and as high as a 64%. Here you can see some of the ranges for the other words. These are really large disparities in understanding. We hear the same word, but we interpret it differently. And this lack of precision introduces greater risk when making decisions. We don't want that ambiguity. What we want are the actual probabilities in the form of numbers, not ambiguous words. Because as we've seen here and in the Bay of Pigs examples, language can mean different things to different people. Now, if we had complete certainty and can say with absolute confidence that something is or is not going to happen, that's pretty easy to convey numerically. So that would either be zero or 100 on the probability scale. But what about in between? How do we think about something in between that's more uncertain? Let's take something simple that we can all conceptualize. Flipping a coin. What is the chance of it landing on heads? 50%. So that's another number we're comfortable with. We generally know what 50% means or feels like. If someone tells you there is a 50% chance that their flight will arrive on time, most of us have a pretty clear mental image of what that 50% means. If there were two worlds, in one world the flight would arrive on time, and in the other world it wouldn't. So now we have three numbers we are comfortable using to convey probabilities. 0, 50, and 100. Do we know more? Let's take a look at this wheel that is equally divided into four parts. If I were to spin the wheel, what's the likelihood that I will land on a white section instead of a black section? That's pretty simple, right? 25%. When you're told that an event has a 25% likelihood of happening, you can imagine there are four worlds, and in one of the four worlds, it will happen. That's a number we're pretty familiar with, and then on the flip side, we know that the likelihood the wheel will land on black is 75%. Generally, for most adults, and likely for most of your students, these are the five numbers that will be seen most often in their estimates or predictions of probability. 0, 25, 50, 75, and 100. These are generally quite intuitive for us to have mental models about. And there's nothing wrong with only working with these five numbers at the beginning because it's hard to internalize probability. But as we begin to incorporate numerical estimates into our thinking about past, present, and future events, and as we get feedback or see the outcomes of those estimates, we start to be able to internalize more granular degrees of probability. As we discussed in the previous video, incorporating numeracy into our predictions and estimations of the world can help deepen the precision with which we communicate and understand uncertainty. But oftentimes people are overconfident in their estimations of their beliefs. We often think that we're right even when we're wrong, despite the fact that we frequently don't have true or complete data to support our estimates. One practice to improve the way we think about the world and the way we work with others is to add a degree of confidence to our estimations. So for example, when we say we think something is true, we add the degree of confidence that we have about that belief. Instead of, this lesson plan was designed really well, I think it's gonna be really successful when I implement it tomorrow, we can say, I am 75% confident that this lesson will be successful tomorrow. When we speak to our degree of confidence, this creates the opportunity for us to be introduced to new information that might change our minds. It provides an opportunity for us to imagine various outcomes, and it frees us up from having our identity attached to the outcome. When we say this lesson is going to be really successful, the outcome would either prove you right or wrong. The lesson will be successful or it won't. But when we add in our degree of confidence, we can then begin to think proactively. What factors might get in the way of the success? What factors that are up to chance might play a role? What input might a colleague have that would help me uncover any blind spots in the lesson? What haven't I accounted for? 
Adding confidence levels to your perceptions of the world is one way to stay open-minded, intellectually humble, and committed to truth-seeking. For most people, we don't have practice making estimates about our confidence. It's not something we learn from an early age or that we do on a regular basis. So it can feel uncomfortable or challenging at first. The key is to make it a regular practice. Ask yourself or your students, how confident am I? How confident are you? How confident are we? Or ask yourself or the group you're making decisions with, what information would make me or us feel more or less confident? In this video, we will explore base rates, another concept of thinking probabilistically that is important to consider and which most people tend to ignore. Base rates are the naturally occurring frequency of something in a general population. To explore this topic, we'll begin by talking about Linda. So if you think back to the Recognizing and Resisting Cognitive Biases module, when you came across Linda, a character from a study that was conducted in the 1980s. So participants were told that she was single, outspoken, and very bright, and that she majored in philosophy. Then participants had to decide whether it was more likely that she was a bank teller or a feminist bank teller. And people tended to erroneously answer that she was a feminist bank teller. This error was due to a heuristic or cognitive shortcut called the representativeness heuristic. Linda had many features that were representative of 1980s ideas of feminism. So people mistakenly thought it was more likely that she was a feminist bank teller than just a bank teller in general. But this diagram here in purple and orange helps us see why probabilistically this is not possible. Feminist bank tellers are a subset of all bank tellers, so the number of bank tellers overall needs to be equal or more than the population of feminist bank tellers. Now, turning back to the concept of base rates, let's look at another similar example, which also reviews representativeness, but additionally shows an example of ignoring the base rate. So here is Steve, and Steve is shy. Is Steve more likely to be a salesperson or a librarian? Well, if you're making this judgment and likely relying on the representativeness heuristic, then you might think, well, librarians are shy, they work in a quiet environment, while salespeople probably need to be more outgoing since they have to talk to people and make deals and so forth, so Steve is probably a librarian. But when we come to that conclusion, what we are doing is ignoring the base rate of salespeople versus librarians in the overall population. On this little graph here, we can see there are a lot more salespeople in general in the population than there are librarians. So even if the proportion of people in a certain career who are shy is higher for librarians than it is for salespeople, because there are so many more salespeople, even a smaller proportion of shy people will lead to more shy salespeople than shy librarians. And even though it's unlikely that we would know the exact percentage of the population that are salespeople versus librarians, we can use our general understanding of the world and our society to rely on the principle of base rates so that we don't ignore important information when making judgments or decisions. Let's look at another example of incorporating base rates when forming a judgment or making an estimate. And this one comes from our colleagues at Good Judgment. So let's say it's 2018 and you're attending the royal wedding of Harry and Meghan, and someone turns to ask you, what's the likelihood that they'll stay married after five years? You might say, well, they look successful, they're not teenagers, they're in their 30s, they won't stress over finances, they look happy. I think that the likelihood they'll stay married after five years is probably around 80% or something like that. This is a very typical type of response from people when it comes to a question like this. But if you are really thinking probabilistically, that is not where you should start. You should begin by thinking, well, let's look at some base rates. So you might ask, what's the likelihood that British people get divorced or Americans or Canadians? Because Megan lived in Canada for many years. So my research tells me that's around 50%. Maybe you would ask, well, how many of Harry's closest royal family members or how many of Queen Elizabeth's children have been divorced? Well, in that generation, that's three out of four, so that's 75%. This is what we call looking at the outside view or starting from how similar situations like this have happened before. Most typical people begin by looking at the inside view. 
In other words, what's happening only in this particular situation? Overemphasizing the inside view leads to what we call base rate insensitivity, or ignoring how something usually goes in a general population and focusing more narrowly on the individual characteristics of the current situation. But research has shown that when forecasters start with the base rates first and then incorporate information from the inside view, their predictions are more accurate. So to utilize base rates in your everyday life or with your students, begin by asking questions like, how do situations like this usually go? Or how likely is this in the overall population? And then move to the inside view. How might this time be different? Now, which base rates you look at and what perspective you take on the outside view is where the decision maker's individual judgments come in. For example, to the high school junior trying to get a basketball scholarship, you might ask, what do we know about how many varsity basketball players get college sports scholarships? Or we might look at what percentage of college athletes lose their scholarships due to injuries. To the new teen driver, we might look at different kinds of data. So we might want to know about how many car accidents involve drivers distracted by their phones. Or we might focus on what time of day are most teen accidents likely to occur. If you have a colleague deciding whether to invest in starting a new tutoring business, you might ask, all right, what do we know about the base rate of new businesses that succeed in their first, first year? Or we might ask more specifically, what is the average lifespan of a tutoring business in this region? Once we get a rough sense of these probabilities from the outside view, we can incorporate what we know from the inside view or the present situation to begin to make arguments for or against outcomes. Going back to the case of Harry and Meghan, maybe we think about how they're getting married at an older age, they don't have financial concerns, so this makes their options, uh, their, the likelihood they'll stay together higher, or maybe we're thinking about, well, they're really in the public eye and maybe that's really stressful and that makes their likelihood lower. When we begin with the outside view and incorporate base rates before judging a specific situation, we are more likely to form more accurate judgments. As you may remember from a previous module, one thing that skillful decision makers do is consider their values and what matters to them most in a given decision. And it would be great if we could always just choose the opportunity we value more. But this misses a key piece of the puzzle. Imagine it's report card conference time and you have evening conferences starting at 5 p.m. You have two hours between school ending and the start of conferences, and in that time there are a few things you would value accomplishing. You'd like to take a little break, get some dinner, and maybe review your notes for conferences. Two options come to mind. First, you consider trying to meet up with friends for dinner at a nearby restaurant since it would be great to have some social time and a mental break before diving into a long evening of conferences. Alternatively, you could order food in your classroom, which would be quicker and allow you to do some prep work before meeting with families. So which option do you choose? In weighing the two options, you realize you really could use the mental break and you would feel rejuvenated from time with friends. You realize you value this option more than you value being able to prepare for conferences. So if you go solely by what you value more, going out to dinner with friends is clearly the better option. But of course, there's more to the decision than just what you value. You also need to consider how likely it is that each decision option will turn out how you hope. For example, while dinner with friends sounds great, how likely is it that you will actually be able to get friends together at the last minute, commute to the restaurant, order food, eat, and get back to school feeling mentally refreshed and re-energized before conferences begin? Combining how much a choice is worth to you with how likely it is to happen is a calculation that we call expected utility. The higher the expected utility, the better it is to choose the option. It's easy for our brains to focus on what we value the most, in this case, that fun dinner with friends. Unfortunately, our brains are not naturally wired to combine that with probabilities and get excited about the decision options that have the highest expected utility. So we have to harness our system two thinking to help us. And to do so, we can turn to a mathematical tool called expected value. When we calculate expected value, we multiply the value of an option by the probability it will happen. 
Let's explore this calculation in a simple math exercise before applying it to the dinner example we just discussed. Imagine you have a choice to pick one of two different scratch-off lottery tickets. The first offers a 20% chance of winning $100, and the second offers a 50% chance of winning $50. Which is the better option? All of us would obviously rather win $100. But which is actually the better option? In other words, how could you make this choice rationally? The answer is to look at the expected value of each option and compare them. When we multiply the likelihood of the option by the value of the option, we see in the first scenario that we have 20% times 100, which gives us an expected value of $20. And in the second option, we have 50% chance of winning $50, which gives us an expected value of $25. According to the calculations of expected value, the second option is clearly better, meaning that on average, choosing the 50% chance of only $50 is better than the 20% chance of $100. Even if we're only going to choose once, we should go with the result that on average yields the higher result. So that might feel counterintuitive, but that's actually the point of engaging system two thinking and using the expected value calculation. When deliberating about a choice where our gut or our intuition gets focused on what we most want, in this example, that would be the $100, we're better off using our deliberate thinking and calculating the answer. So now let's see if we can apply the same concept to our dinner decision. First, we need to determine how much each option is worth, which we can describe with a subjective but still numerical value. So let's say out of a possible score of 100, I assign Dinner with Friends a score of 60. If it could happen, it would be really fun and a good brain break, though it wouldn't give me time to prepare for conferences. For ordering in and eating in my classroom, I give that a score of 20 out of 100. It's not my preferred option, but it still has some value as it would give me time to prepare and eat before conferences start. Now I need to think about how likely it is that each option will turn out as I hope. Using subjective probabilities, or probabilities derived from my own judgment, I assess that dinner with friends has about a 20% chance of turning out well, meaning my friends will be available, we can all get to the restaurant on time, we can eat in a relaxed way, and I can still get back to school on time for conferences. Ordering in and eating in my classroom is a more sure bet. I think that has about a 90% likelihood of turning out as I hope, meaning I'll get to eat and I'll have some time to prepare for conferences. So now that we've got our values and our likelihoods, we can run the math. So 20% times 60 and 90% times 20. Here I see I get an expected utility of 12 for going out to dinner with friends and 18 for ordering in and eating in my classroom. When I do the expected value calculations, it's clear that ordering in and eating in my classroom and prepping for conferences is the better choice if I take into account both the value and the likelihood of each option. This scenario, however, is a great example of why skillful decision makers regularly try to come up with more than two decision options. While ordering food to the classroom has a higher expected utility than going out with friends, it's not an option that I value very highly. Is there possibly another option that I would value more and that would have a greater likelihood of working out? So for example, could I go out to eat with a colleague who has the same conference schedule and is already in the same place as me? Or could I go to a restaurant by myself but bring some work so that I both get some prep in for my conference while also getting a change of scenery? And is there even possibly another app option? No matter what decision you're making, and which options you evaluate, it's important to consider not just which option is worth more to you, but also how likely is it to pan out if you pursue it, and to calculate this across all your decision options. If people do this enough so that it becomes habitual or routine when it comes to big impactful decisions, they'll be more likely to make decisions that maximize their overall expected utility. Every time we make a decision without considering both the value and the probability, we're missing out on what would make us happier, healthier, more fulfilled, and so on. The more you practice with expected value calculations when the probabilities are objective, like in that scratch-off lotto example, and then apply it to decisions using expected utility, 
the better you get at it and the more you hone this way of thinking. The key here is to get more of what you want most in life by doing more than trusting your gut. Take the time to think about the combination of what you want and the likelihoods. Think in terms of expected utility.